Hello, John Owens here from John Owens International. And welcome to this masterclass in which I'm going to describe how you can use the power of master data management to help your enterprise make sure that it meets all its commitments to GDPR. For those of you who don't already know me, let me tell you a bit about my background. I've worked in the field of IT and business and data modeling for more than 35 years now in nine different countries right around the globe, stretching all the way from Ireland to New Zealand. In that time, I've worked with people from hundreds of different enterprises in scores of different industries. I've been very lucky to have worked with really gifted colleagues and mentors from whom I have learned so much. One of my earliest mentors gave me this piece of advice. Always make sure that you simplify before you computerize. Otherwise, you simply get automated chaos. Now, this simple statement is perhaps one of the most powerful pieces of information that's been given to me in that time. And it served me well over th for over three decades now. Now, it's especially true if you're setting out on GDPR, and I will explain why in the course of this masterclass. You can't underestimate the power of modeling. Removing complexity always brings power to an enterprise. Now, myself and a colleague, Nicholas Han, we modeled the whole of a national gas and oil giant in the Netherlands over a period of 10 months. Now, the modeling techniques we used removed loads of complexity and duplication from the business, and this brought real clarity, both to senior management and the operational staff. So powerful was our final model that was adopted by Shell and has become a global standard for oil and gas exploration and production industry. Working with another colleague, Phil Irvin, at BP Chemicals in Wales, we used the power of data modelling to build a system that enabled one person in the training department to define, schedule and monitor over 100,000 hours of training for 5,000 staff and contractors. The techniques we used gave a structure that was both robust and versatile, and this enabled BP to roll the system out across many more of its chemical plants. Now, I've been working with master data management structures for over 20 years, uh, and once again, in partnership with Phil Irvin, we modelled the total product structure of HP Bulmer, and this is the UK's oldest cider company. And using advanced air master data management techniques, we were able to enable them to integrate all of their procurement, brewing, production and sales systems. Now, the reason I give you these examples is to let you know that the techniques that I'll be covering in this masterclass are very powerful, truly international. They'll work for any industry and they will bring real business benefits. Now, over the years, I've been privileged to have trained and mentored thousands of people in the area of business and data modeling around the globe. It gave me great pleasure to be able to share with so many people all of the great knowledge and wisdom that's been shared with me. The more I shared, the more people would ask me how I could be sure that the inference that I was making during my analysis and modeling work uh, was correct. And in order to answer them truthfully, I had to become crystal clear myself about my thinking and modeling techniques. Now, as my clarity grew, I decided to write it all down. So I headed off to one of the most beautiful places on earth, Queenstown, New Zealand. And in this slide, you can see actually see the view from my office, as I called it, uh, of Queenstown Hill looking over the beautiful Lake Wakatipu. And I spent four months there creating IMM, the Integrated Modeling Method. The power of IMM is based on all of my previous learning, going right back to the advice about always removing complexity. 
And over and above that, I incorporated the power of all the integrated data modeling that I developed with Phil Irvin at BP Chemicals and Bulmers and the function modeling that I had worked with Nicholas Han back uh, with the island gas company in the Netherlands, bringing all this together into an integrated whole. I've written a series of five books on IMM and they've sold in 15 countries around the world. And you'll have received one of them on data structure modeling when you enrolled for this masterclass. I've always believed in the power of master data management and I've been building master data management structures into businesses for over two decades. As the subject of MDM began to become more mainstream in recent years, I knew that something more powerful than the standard approach was needed if master data management was to truly succeed in fixing the fragmentation that has crept into so many enterprises. I brought together the most powerful techniques that I knew for removing complexity and duplication and an integrated approach that I termed multidimensional MDM. I called it multidimensional because it enables an enterprise to look at its master entities from several points of view simultaneously and so get a fully integrated multidimensional understanding of them that will be consistent right across the business. So that's a brief, brief fact. So that's a brief background of how I came to be delivering this masterclass to you. I feel that GDPR is going to present most enterprises with immense challenges. I also feel that if they are to succeed, they'll need an approach that makes the task as painless as possible by allowing them to remove complexity and duplication. And that's the reasoning I'm running these masterclasses, to be able to share the powerful techniques that I've developed over the years and share them with as many people as possible. I'm so glad that you're here. So let's get started. We'll start off with a presentation of all the master data management techniques that will help ensure that your enterprise can meet all of its GDPR, GDPR requirements. We'll then have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. If you do have any questions, that arise during the presentation, then please enter them in the chat box at the bottom right of your screen and include your email address. This means that if I don't get to answer them during the question and answer session, I'll be able to answer them by email for, to you after the masterclass. Now, at the end of the question and answer session, I'd like to talk to you about some really powerful mentoring workshop that I'll be running to give you hands-on help with your GDPR projects, and that will greatly increase your chances of success. And I have a very special offer uh, that you'll be really love to hear about for all of the masterclass attendees. So we'll come back to that offer at the end of the presentation. What exactly is GDPR? Well, it has 99 articles over several hundred pages. I can still remember my first reaction when I heard about GDPR. Panic! Now, this is a piece of legislation, as I said, that it comprised of 99 separate articles. How would it be possible for anyone apart from an international lawyer, to have any chance of understanding it, let alone implementing it. I felt slightly overwhelmed when I thought about the sheer volume of learning that would be needed to get GDPR right. Surely I wasn't the only person to feel this way. So at that moment, I took a deep breath, calmed down and decided to find a way through my initial panic. I began to ask questions of some key friends and colleagues, and some of whom had been involved with GDPR right uh, from its inception. The more I listened, the more I became convinced that GDPR, in spite of the amount of paperwork behind it, did not need to be complicated. The more I learned, the clearer it became that GDPR was merely trying to get enterprises to do what advocates of data governance and master data management had been advising them to do for years, 
namely have robust data structures and remove all complexity and duplication. This truly was a wow moment for me. It became clear that instead of every enterprise having to face an insurmountable obstacle called GDPR, they would, by using a select set of master data management structures, be able to build an architecture that had enabled them to rid themselves of masses of complexity and replication and make GDPR both achievable and sustainable. In fact, GDPR would make them even much more resilient commercially. So here is a definition of GDPR. The General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, is a regulation by which the European Parliament, the Council of the European Union, and the European Commission intend to strengthen and unify data protection for all individuals within the European Economic Area, the EEA. So what does GDPR cover? Well, it's all about ensuring that personal information of individuals located within the European Economic Area is treated with respect and properly managed and controlled in line with the requirements of GDPR by enterprises who hold this information. Who does it affect? Well, let's look at the myths first. The myths are that it only applies to businesses that are located within the EEA. Not so. Uh, it only applies to citizens and residents of the EEA. Not so. It does not apply to my businesses as I am only little. Mm, probably not so. And we'll look at that in another masterclass we'll be running later in the year. So let's say who does it affect? Well, GDPR applies to any enterprise anywhere in the world that holds personal information on an individual located within the EEA. So the, the individual just needs to be located within the EEA and if you're holding personal information on them, then you are subject to the requirements of GDPR. Who is liable if you breach the terms of GDPR? Well, the business itself can be fined and the fines are big up to 10 million euro or 2% of the company's global annual turnover of the previous financial year uh, and up to or up to 20 million or 4% of the company's annual turnover in the previous financial year. Now the up to 10 million is for paper breaches where you're not really so you just your, your paperwork is not in all that. But the 20 million is for acts or omissions that constitute a breach. So if you've done something really wrong with the person's data, then you are slapped with the 20 million. But what this is what a lot of people don't realize is that under GDPR, officers and directors of enterprises can be personally financially responsible and liable for breaches of GDPR by their enterprise. And this is another new thing. If you're holding an individual's information and you breach the terms, the terms of GDPR, then individuals can sue the enterprise that misuses their personal data. And they have no requirement to prove that they suffered loss. They just need, if they can show that you've misused their data under the terms of GDPR, then you, they can sue you. So how can master data management help you know you help to you to comply with the requirements of GDPR? The two greatest barriers to GDPR compliance are complexity and replication. And MDM can remove both of these. When we're looking about removing uh, complexity, MDM enables you to spot the complexity in the way that you currently hold personal data. But more importantly, MDM shows you how to remove this complexity and transform it to a structure that will meet your GDPR requirements. So it doesn't just 
highlight the problem because you may already know you have a problem but it also shows you the way to come up with a robust and sustainable solution. MDM structures are especially powerful in allowing you to identify and remove the replication of personal data and as GDPR is all about personal data of individuals it's essential for you to uh, remove that replication if you are to comply with GDPR. So what is the overall approach in, in for master data management to be able to help you? Well, the first one is to create a master data management architecture for your enterprise around the areas where it holds personal information. And this is the blueprint for GDPR compliance. This is the that will show you where you need to get to. So it makes GDPR achievable. And then you migrate all of your systems and database that are holding personal information to match up with the MDM structure that we have mapped. So let's look at MDM rule one. Customer is not a master entity in any enterprise anywhere. What does that mean? Well, customer is merely a role played by the true master entity, which is an individual party. Now, other roles that can be played by an individual party include roles like supplier, an employee, a guarantor, an agent, a director, and many, many, many more. So what is happening if you don't have MDM structures? Well, let's look at that. All commercial transactions in every enterprise are done with another party, and a party can be an individual or another enterprise. Now, all breaches of GDPR will occur due to replication and errors in individual party data. Now, let's look at how this replication begins and spreads. So here we have the sales system. Now, when the enterprise makes a sale to an individual, they create a record in the sales system and they enter an individual's personal data in there and they call the individual a customer. Then we have the HR system and if we employ an individual, we create a record in the HR system and we call the individual an employee. Here we have a purchase system and if we purchase something from an individual, uh, we put them in here and we create uh, an individual's information in here and we call them a supplier. We then have um, a pension system and now we have all the employees with the organization. We put them into the pension system and replicate their personal data in there and we call them a beneficiary. We then have an agency system and we have individuals who uh, act as agents to us. Uh, we put them in there, the individual information, and we call, it, call them an agent. And then the finance system. And here we have an individual, uh, individual's information in the finance system. And they're there and they can be either a creditor or a debtor. So we have individuals' personal data held in seven systems in seven times, as I say, in six different systems. And this is a GDPR disaster. So is it possible in real life for one person in one enterprise to appear in so many different uh, information systems? Well, I can give you a real-life example of my partner, Pam Walden, uh, when she worked at a university. Uh, 
and she was a part of the admin section at the university. Uh, she also, uh, from time to time, took courses at the university, and with uh, her qualifications, she also became a freelance lecturer at the university. So, how many information systems did she appear in? Well, let's have a look. First of all, she is an employee, so straight away she goes into the HR system. Now, uh, all employees, of course, have got to get paid, so she then has to go into the payroll system. Also, all employees automatically qualify for the pension system to be they're eligible for pension, so they have to go into the pension system for that. And they also automatically qualify to be members of the social club. So in there, so now we're up to one, two, three, four systems. Now Pam was really loved learning and self-improvement, so she became a student on lots of courses at the university, so she goes into the enrollment system. And because she builds up her qualifications, uh, she then uh, actually becomes qualified to become a lecturer on some course at the university. So she's now in the, as a freelance lecturer, she's in the freelance lecturing system. And as a freelance lecturer, she needs to get paid. So she now goes into the finance system. So here we have one individual in one enterprise in seven different systems with personal information held seven different times. And here's another example. We have a gentleman who acts as an insurance agent with an insurance company and he's part of the sales team. So he sells insurance policies and because he's part of the insurance company, he takes out insurance policies uh, on himself and his family. And also he operates a small insurance agency on behalf of the enterprise in one of the local states. So how many systems within the insurance company did he appear in? Well, let's have a look. First of all, we have him because he's an employee, he's in the HR system and he has to get paid, so he goes into the payroll system. He sells insurance policies on behalf of the company, so he goes into the sales system. Uh, he also takes out cover from himself and his family, so he goes into the policy system. He runs the small agency on behalf of the company, so he has to go into the agency system. And because he has to get paid for the policies he sells through his small agency, he has to go into the finance system. So here we have one individual whose personal details are held in six different systems in one single enterprise. So it happens time and time and time again. So how can we avoid this repeated duplication in enterprises? Well, the answer is simple. It is to implement a single central party system. So how do we go about building a single central party system? Well, let's go back to the example we had previously of an employee working in an insurance company. Now here we had an individual whose personal information was held in six separate satellite systems. So how do we get this and merge it? Well, we need to actually see the personal information in the satellite systems and we need to drag this out and bring it to a single system at the core of the enterprise. So all the occurrences of the employee whether it's HR or pension or whatever, they need to be deleted and move to a system right at the center of the enterprise where they're held once and once only. And then all of the satellite systems can access the central system and read the information about the individual that's held at the center. Uh, they can't update it uh, locally in the, the set. The satellite systems can't update the record. They can update it in the central system. So there's always one record, only one record. And when it's updated by one, 
uh, satellite system, that record is updated and appears updated to all systems. So here we have a central party system that holds party data once a month only and feeds all of the systems around the enterprise. And we can do exactly the same thing for the example where we had the university employee in seven separate systems. Once again, we need to remove all of the personal information from the satellite systems, bring it to a core system at the center, and, and deleting it in the satellite systems. Now all the satellite systems get the personal information from the core system. They read it from there, they update it there. When it's updated by one satellite system, it's immediately changed for all satellite systems. Uh, and there is no inconsistency. You're totally in line with GDPR all the time because you know when uh, the, the regulator comes and says to you, how many times do you hold this uh, information on this person? The answer is once and only once. Uh, where is it held? It's held this, in this system. Who has access? You know precisely who has access to it. Now, in order to build the central party system, there are two essential prerequisites. And the first of this is to have an effective, unique identifier for the individual party. And the other is that you need to have the concept of what I call party role in the enterprise. So let's look at prerequisite one, which is defining an effective, unique identifier for an individual party. So here we have UID rule 101. And this is that the unique identifier, the UID, of an individual party is never a code. So let's see why not. We'll use the example of the insurance employee to actually make the point and clarify the point. Here we have John Smith, say that's the um, sales agent's name, and he is held in the finance system where he'll have an account ID. Uh, he's held in the HR system where he'll have an employee ID. He's held in the agency system uh, where he'll have an agency ID. In the sales system where he'll have a customer ID. The employee system, the payroll system, sorry, he'll have an employee ID again, uh, and it may be the same or different than the HR system, and in the policy system, a beneficiary ID. Um, now, this doesn't work, because you can see there's, you, you're supposed to have a unique identifier, and here we have six unique codes, all referring to the same party. Now, when it comes to unique identifiers for individuals and, and GDPR, some people have proposed, uh, say, that we should use the European Union country citizen codes, because many of the, the countries in the EU and the EEA have got citizens code. Um, they're only a possibility because you'd have to harmonise them all because they're not the same. But the biggest thing that stops you using that is, in fact, that not all the people who, in fact, uh, come under GDPR are EU citizens. It is anybody located within the European Union or the EEA that will come in, but they could be citizens from anywhere in the world. So EU uh, citizen country code will not apply. So what is a good individual party unique identifier? Now, Basic rule, it has to be made up of data that you already hold or will hold if you do business with the individual. So how would this work? Well, you say, let's say first name, second name, family name, age and gender. Are they good things to make up a unique identifier? Well, let's have a look at this second name. Now, not everyone has a second name, but you could default this to something like unknown or not given and it would still contribute to a unique identifier. But what about age and gender? Well, many enterprises have been trading for years, and apart from individuals who are employees, um, they have never recorded gender or age. Uh, so it's not useful. Again, 
uh, you couldn't start recording gender and age because it would be inappropriate um, for many of the transactions you're doing. If you're just getting somebody who wants to buy shoes from you, they don't have to give gender and age, and uh, GDPR would prevent you from collecting that. So again, that is, you can't always count on that one there. I have seen the situation where age and gender have been used. Now, this is a finance company, uh, and as part of their lending criteria, the finance company, they, they'd always record gender and age. So these two elements were known and were valid. However, this was in Ireland, this finance company, and there was a lot of duplication if only these five elements were used as party. So something additional was needed. And this was the current residential address. So although you could have many people called uh, a Michael Paul Murphy, uh, with his first name, second name, family name, uh, who's age 25, um, and of course he's male, uh, you would have lots of those around Ireland. But if you put them at a single address, then it's highly unlikely that you would have two Michael Murphys at the same address. You might have two Michael Murphys, fathers and son, but they wouldn't be the same age. So the current residential address, these do make a unique identifier. I did for that finance company. And again, date stamped residential addresses are very powerful because sometimes people move um, and you don't know the current residential address because they haven't told you. They have they no need for them to notify you that they've moved. But in your uh, world, if you've had a date stamped residential address, this will still be valid. It's not wrong because it's actually saying at the date that they gave you this address, it was true and it will remain true uh, forever because at the date, that was the residential address. Now, addresses are also important uh, in your talking about master data management and GDPR. You have to realize that an individual party can have relationships with many addresses. Here, for example, we have a Mr. H. Guest who has got uh, uh, an association with an address at 63 Penfield Lane, in fact, which is his residence. So the use he makes of this address is his residence. At 75 High Street, it is his UK office. At uh, Madison Avenue, it is his US office. His European office is in Rue du Charles de Gaulle. And he has a holiday home at George Street, Dunedin, New Zealand. So one party making use of many addresses. And similarly, one address may have a relationship with many parties. So here we have that the Madison Avenue address, 3280 Madison Avenue, in fact, is the US office for many different people. So again, important when you're looking at unique identifiers, to realize it is a combination of things that makes people unique. Now, for those of you who like to see these associations represented as an entity relationship diagram, here we have the entities involved. We have an entity for the individual party. We have the address. We link the party to the address through the party address use here and it is date stamped it has a start date which it must have it doesn't have an end date because it may not have ended and it has a relationship to the address use type over here uh, and when you combine these three things plus the date so party address address type and start date they will be unique for party So an inactive effective UID for party is essential for two prime reasons. One is that it prevents duplicates being created in the century of party system for parties that are already there. And it prevents duplicators being created as individual party data is moved from satellite systems to the central system. So this is important. So when you're merging uh, your data from the uh, satellite systems into the core system, if you don't have an effective unique identifier for that information coming in, you will create duplicates because they will look as if they are something different. 
and an individual party union identifier completes the first prerequisite for a central party system. The second prerequisite for implementing a central party system successfully is to have the MDM structure of party role in the enterprise and in the systems. It's the MDM structure called party role that enables an enterprise, one, to only need to hold an individual state once and once only, and two, to be able to use that individual data as many times as are, is required and still not breach GDPR. So let's build up a structure showing how we can use party role. Now in this uh, example I'm giving here, if those of you are familiar with uh, entity relationship diagrams will realize, uh, will understand what it's about, but I'll talk us through it anyway. So here we have a commercial transaction and a commercial transaction could be uh, a sale or a purchase and it'll be for a product. So the next thing we need to do, uh, we need to say, uh, what's the relationship between uh, the commercial transaction and the party? And here we have party can be either a corporation or an individual. So are we selling to the individual or are we buying from the individual? And we link the party or the individual to the commercial transaction through the structure called party role. So now we have an individual party connected to the commercial transaction. And this tells us precisely what the party is, what the role is playing in the party. This down here, this role, uh, tells us that it could be that they're playing a customer or a purchaser or an agent, a guarantor. There can be many, many roles that a party can play. And party and role link the party to the role and the commercial transaction. Very, very powerful structure. And the next really powerful thing about party role, if we look here, we see we have an entity called GDPR role rule uh, on the right hand side of the diagram here. And this entity holds the GDPR rules that tells us for each role, what data we can hold, how long we can hold it, who can access it, etc. Any other rules uh, of GDPR that relate to uh, how, how you can ho use an individual's data can be held in the GDPR role rule. So developing the party role structure completes the second prerequisite for a central party system. So with party role structure, an individual's data can be held once and one known, once only and used as many times as required by the enterprise and ensures that GDPR is never breached. So here we have a diagram that shows how the central party system is in the center and all of the satellite systems can use the central individual's information. This can be used by them in line with it. They will be using in line with the party role that links the central system to the satellite system. And the really powerful thing about the party role is that it holds the GDPR rules. So the, the satellite system is not allowed to breach the terms of GDPR because the rules on the which you can use the individual's data held in the central party system are controlled by the GDPR role rules. So here's a question. Is a central party system achievable in an enterprise that is up and running and fully operational? When I've spoken about this to many people in the past, they said, not possible, no, can we be done on a greenfield site? Well, that's not true. Here we have an example from the National Bank of India. Um, when I was at a uh, Master Data Management Conference uh, as a speaker in Sydney, I ran into a a gentleman called Ram Kumar, who at that time was working for AIG in Australia and had done a fantastic uh, project for on behalf of AIG with the National Bank of India. And he had implemented using the same uh, master data management techniques and structures that I'm talking about in this masterclass, 
he had implemented a central party system. Now, was this a trivial uh, implementation? Well, what do you think? The National Bank of India has got 25,000 branches, 250 million individuals playing 37 or more different poss possible roles that they can play. It has 37 plus satellite systems holding, it had 37 systems holding party data. So the thing was to how do you collapse all of that down into one satellite system when you're talking about 250 million individuals in 25,000 branches. And it was done. All that individual party was merged into the central system with great success, success that actually delivered huge operational, commercial and service benefits. The service benefits are really one of the things that Ram sings about, the, the success of this. It was amazing with the uh, by having party data held in one place and being able to give an overall view of all of the ways you could help people when they rang up. So you weren't selling things they didn't need. You weren't overexposing them. It was very powerful and a total success. So the answer is, yes, it can be done. And if it can be done in the National Bank of India, it can be done anywhere. So next we're going to have our question and answer session. However, before we go into that, I would like to remind you that uh, at the end of this masterclass, we do have great news about how we can work together and help you to have real success in your GDBR projects and a very special offer around that and the way we can work together. A uh, very special offer for all of the delegates on this masterclass today. So please stay with us uh, to the end of the question and answer session uh, and I'll tell you all about that. And also, you'll find out lots of interesting things, I hope, in the answers to the questions. So do hang about. So now let's get into our question and answers. Okay, we've got some good questions here. <clears throat> all right. Does GDPR only apply to companies operating within the EU? And that's from Maria. Okay, Maria, no, it operates to companies globally. So if you are doing business and you're holding personal information of uh, individuals who are located within the European economic area uh, that's slightly bigger than the larger than the EU, then you are subject to the terms of GDPR. It doesn't matter where your business is located. Uh, Jonathan asks, what are the type of things that mean you are breaking GDPR rules? Well, um, the various things, uh, first of all, if you're holding an individual's information, then you can only hold it for the reasons that they've given you consent. Uh, you can't, say, take on as make a sale and then suddenly decide to mark it unless you've got the uh, individual consent to do so. If you've taken them on as a prospect, uh, you can't remark it for something else. Uh, if you are gathering the information, you, only, you must gather the minimum amount uh, required. So you, you, if you just need first name and email address, then you don't, you can't ask for first name, second name, age, gender, address, etc. So they would all be breaches. I operate an online store that sells products over the internet. If a buyer is from inside the EU, then I need to be compliant, even though I am based in Australia. That's from Marcy. Yes, Marcy, if the a uh, buyer is currently located in within the EU or the EEA, then you do need to be compliant even though you're in Australia. And the thing is the EU ha has got uh, relationships with all countries around the world. So its regulators uh, will be in touch with the, uh, the Australian regulators. And if you're seen to be breaking the uh, terms of uh, the GDPR, then the Australian regulators will come knocking on your door. 
Uh, here's a question from Rob. If it does apply to companies outside the EU, how would the EU enforce fines? Again, Rob, as it would probably slightly, partly um, answered in the previous one, if you're living in an area of somewhere like Australia, New Zealand, uh, and other countries that have uh, trading relationships with the EU, then the EU regulators would, in fact, uh, if they saw uh, somebody in Australia breaching the terms of GDPR, they would contact the Australian uh, regulators and the Australian regulator would come knocking on your door. And this is the same. This will happen in the even in the United States. Um, uh, and that's because there are already existing agreements and the United States does have to conform to these. Yeah, we have another question. I often write articles and give away these away as a free download whenever a person signs up uh, online by giving me their name and email address uh, through a sign-up form. If the person who signs up is from within the EU, do I need to know about GDPR? Uh, that's from Wayne. Yes, Wayne, you do, because you're holding information about a person who is currently uh, located within the EU, you do need to conform uh, to uh, GDPR. If you're only picking up their email, uh, their first name and their email address, then you are, and as long as you're not using it for any other purpose other than to post them, uh, you know, to send them the article, then you are in compliant, in compliance. But we will be doing uh, another masterclass later in the year where we'll be looking at small businesses and um, we've done some work with a, a brilliant gentleman called Axel Troik from Quebec who's in, uh, produced a great guide for small businesses that ensure helps them to become GDPR compliant without having to go through the whole gamut of, of what a multinational would have to be done. And we'll be sending that out to uh, everybody and all the attendees in the masterclass, we will be able to send you a complimentary copy of Axel's um, uh, free guide. And we'll also be running, uh, telling you how you can get involved in workshops to help you work through and make sure that you're fully compliant. Uh, question here. What are the things that put most businesses at risk at the moment? That's from Gemma. Uh, well, gentlemen, the things uh, I was just say probably earlier on is if they are misusing the data to use data uh, for a reason other than you were given permission uh, is does put you in breach of GDPR for um, holding information that you don't need to hold uh, will put you in breach of GDPR. Uh, only a short while ago, um, a water company in Ireland who was holding national insurance numbers of people of its customers was instructed to delete them all because uh, the regulators deemed that it was not necessary in order to have them as customers to have the national insurance number. Uh, another one. I run online events such as webinars, masterclass, etc. If delegates are from within the EU, then I need to be compliant. I'm not based in the EU. And this is from Michelle. Again, Michelle, yeah, it's, it doesn't matter where you're based, anywhere in the world, if you're, the people on whom you're holding um, uh, personal information are located within the EU, uh, then you do need to be compliant, and it doesn't matter where you're located. Now, the reason I'm using the term located is that the individual doesn't need to be a citizen of any of the EEA states. Uh, they don't need to be resident, officially resident in any of the EEA states. They just need to be located there. And if they are, they then are protected by the terms of GDPR. Uh, similar, but let's run. I run an events company in Australia, and we have people who attend our events from all around the world. If someone attends one of our events in Australia, but they live in the EU, does my company need to obey GDPR? Again, Jeff, if you are holding, if they are uh, officially located, you know, that is the normal location, uh, is within the EU, even though your event is in Australia and you're holding personal information, then their personal information is 
protected by the terms of GDPR. We operate a travel company, this is from Mark, we operate a travel company that helps students from New Zealand to travel to Europe for holidays, exchange visits, etc. These are all New Zealand citizens, so does GDPR apply to us? Now, this is a good question, Mark, um, because as soon as the, the students um, or the others who are you're going to Europe um, land within uh, an EEA country, then they do become subject to the terms and are protected by GDPR. Um, and there's another question I saw coming up, which was, uh, I think somebody asked, is there a defined time? This is Raylene asked the question. Is there a defined time period for which a citizen needs to be located within the EU before GDPR applies? So coming back to, and, and this links up with you, Mark, there isn't a legally defined yet uh, time period. So if they're just landing and passing through uh, on a stopover at um, uh, a German airport, for example, do they come within GDPR? We don't know, but in fact, b believe me, if, they, if, if it's anything more than that, assume that if they're flying over there, then, and they're going to be touring around, and they're going to be there for an extended time of, say, months as opposed to hours, then you will be subject to GDPR. If you breach, and if they, in fact, either the regulator saw you were breaching something, or the individuals themselves found you were in breach, uh, they could, in fact, um, say, get on to uh, the GDPR regulators and um, get them to do something. Or, under the terms of GDPR, they could sue you personally uh, if you, in fact, uh, breach the terms of GDPR. And they don't even have to prove that they suffered any damage. Just the fact that you breached the terms yourself uh, would, in fact, leave you liable and would, you would have to pay up. Here is a question from Janet. Uh, I work as a consultant business analyst at a supermarket chain based in Germany. It never records customers' personal data um, as part of the sales it makes with them. Does GDPR apply to it? Well, uh, a good question, Janet, because, of course, if it's not gathering the personal information of the customers, they're just coming and shopping cash only, then those customers would not uh, come under GDPR. However, uh, it does have uh, employees, which are, it's in Germany, and all the employees will there be located in Germany. And it does have people working, for example, yourself as a consultant business analyst, you, uh, they'll be holding your personal information. And you are at the moment, if you're working there, located within an EEA uh, country, Therefore, your personal information will be subject to GDPR. So the uh, enterprise does come under the terms of GDPR and must make sure it's managing your data and the, uh, the employee's data. And also, if they were, for example, running loyalty schemes with the customers who are coming into store and they were holding the, even the first name, second name and email, that all of that personal information would come under the terms of GDPR. Uh, one of our clients is a bank, and one of the things we have to know about is parental consent for holding information of people below a certain age. Can you do this with MDM? Okay. Not strictly GDPR, but yes, you can do it with MDM, and... Uh, I may need to answer that this question offline uh, via email, and this is from Abel. Um, yeah, you can put in structures, then then you can link, um, show links between individuals, so you can actually show uh, father son, father daughter uh, relationships, and also and and therefore know that if you do need some sort of parental consent, then. Uh, you'll have a structure for that. But also parental consent can be built into some of the relationships. We talked about the uh, uh, party role where you are constra constrained by some relationships that a person would have to be above or below a certain age. 
uh, and that, that would be built into party GDPR as well. So from that point of view, parental consent could come within the realms of GDPR and the information that you hold about somebody. So that's all the questions we've had got time to ask at the moment. Remember, if yours didn't get answered, please don't despair. If you filled it in, it will reach me uh, and it will come by email and I will respond. And you can still, if you still have questions, please carry on and enter them in the box on the bottom right-hand corner. But do make sure you give your email address so as I can respond to your question. Now I want to talk to you about ways in which we can continue to work together uh, so that I can help you achieve GDPR success in your GDPR project. Uh, for that reason, I put together a series of group mentoring programs. So what do these programs look like? Now, each program will run for six weeks and will consist of one of 90 minute live mentoring session each week. And each session will cover in depth a specific MDM structure or technique specific to helping you with your GDPR project. Now, groups are small and exclusive with no more than seven members in each one. Now, this is to ensure that you'll receive sufficient individual time with me to help you achieve real progress. The small group numbers will mean that each member gets the opportunity to receive personal mentoring on your specific challenges. And we'll discuss various options uh, so that you'll be able to take away actions that you can implement back in your enterprise. These personal mentoring sessions are not only provide uh, value to the person uh, who is working one to one with the mentor at that time, but to also the rest of the group who will be listening in and able to hear all that's been suggested. Now, this group mentoring program is not for everyone. It's only really suitable for people who value learning about cutting edge thinking and methods um, that they're going to be able to use to have successful success in their GB, GDPR projects. Uh, for people who are committed to employing the best MDM structures and techniques and implementing these back in their own enterprise. You have to be committed to turning up, contributing to the process and doing the work to ensure a successful and sustainable project. You've got to be dedicated to overcoming your GDPR challenge and take the necessary actions to achieve success. It's for people who need the support of an MDM expert and a mentor, but they're ready to join an exclusive group of like-minded people also striving for GDPR excellence. And if you could have already started your GDPR project or are just about to embark on one and require guidance on what to do next. Now, to take advantage and make the most of these personal mentoring sessions, you must turn up prepared with your challenges and questions clearly defined. So, what do you get for your money in these programs? Uh, you get as I say, uh, six times 90 minute mentoring sessions with a value of $4,500. You'll also get a digital MDM training course, four modules, which are really advanced techniques that you'll be able to use in the most demanding of GDPR projects. They will really guide you through. They're a fantastic set of modules here, value $400. Uh, you get two hours of video on MDM keynote speeches I've made and keynote work uh, and on workshops on MDM value one thousand dollars and four hours videos on data quality keynotes and workshops value two thousand dollars. So the total value of this MDM package for that six week package is seven thousand nine hundred dollars. However. For all of the attendees on this masterclass here today, we're not going to charge you anything like that. In fact, it all you it will cost you to join this is $997. That's right, just $997 for a really intimate six-week session that really will take your GDPR project to a whole new level. And you can pay for this in one or two ways. There are 
two buttons below here and you can say you can uh, pay a one-off uh, payment of $997 today or you can pay two installments, one today of $550 and the next in 14 days of $550. So, if you feel you'd like some serious help with your DG GDPR project, uh, sign up now. And as soon as uh, you sign up, I will come back and contact you so as that I can slot you in to the first available slot for the next uh, six-week session. I really look forward to working on this. It's amazing what we'll be able to do with these techniques and the benefits you're going to be able to derive, but also pass them on to your enterprise. Now, if you feel you need more intensive work than just six weeks, then you can apply to work with me one-to-one. -one. Um, and if you would like to do this, then all you have to do is drop me a line. The email address is shown on the screen here, john at jo-international.com. As soon as I get your email, uh, give me or also give me your telephone number and your Skype contact and I'll contact you directly to find out about your specific requirements so as that we can see if we're a good match at working together one-to-one. -to -one. So that brings us to the end of our masterclass today and thank you for staying with us all the way through. Uh, I would love to help you move forward in your next stage on GDPR. So if that's on one of our six-week mentoring programs, please click on the button below, sign up, and I'll get back to you and get you programmed in on the next available slot. Or if you want to work one-to-one, -one, uh, then do contact me by an email to john at jo-international.com and your telephone number and Skype address and I'll get back and we'll talk about moving forward. I really have enjoyed it. I hope you have. And if you didn't get a chance to have your questions answered in the session and on here, then please don't worry. Uh, they will come through to me an email and I will come back to you. Thank you very much and I look forward to working with you in the future. Bye bye for now.
8, which it must have. It doesn't have an end date because it may not have ended. And it has a relationship to the address use type over here. Uh, and when you combine these three things plus the date, so party, address, address type, and start date, they will be unique for party. So an inactive effective UID for party is essential for two prime reasons. One is that it prevents duplicates being created in the center of party system for parties that are already there. And it prevents duplicators being created as individual party is data is moved from satellite systems to the central system. So this is important. So when you're merging uh, your data from the uh, satellite systems into the core system, if you don't have an effective unique identifier for that information coming in, you will create duplicates because they will look as if they are something different. And an individual party unique identifier completes the first prerequisite for a central party system.